red button. <laughs> that red button. I don't know him. <laughs> I love this music. It came stock with the unit. Guys, thank you for uh, tuning in with us for part two of Yawa this week. Um, if you've been following along with the last couple episodes that we had, we did a little less question answering and a little more in depth here today. We are going to be doing as much question answering as possible. We got through a ton of questions in the first part and we're going to do a second part here. Another 30 minute at a whack and Let's get started. Let's go. Let's go. Are you going first or me? Uh, this one's all you, babe. Okay. From Green Wagon Outfitters on Instagram, looking for a new pup seems daunting. Where do you begin when looking at a pedigree? Well, you begin by deciding whether you want a pointing breed or a flushing breed. That's your first step. Then your next step is deciding what breeder to go with based on their pedigrees of what you're looking for out of a dog. If you want a dog that's going to be a foot hunting dog or a bigger running dog, a more family oriented dog, uh, the biggest thing to do is talk to the breeder, feel comfortable with what they're telling you, um, ask a lot of questions and make sure that they're breeding dogs that are going to fit in with what you're looking for. Okay. You're weirding me out here. My cameraman, one man camera crew. I just had this sick feeling that I had started it and stopped it really pretty quick and that it for some reason wasn't recording and I was. He was nervous. A little. He didn't well, want me to get upset with him that's, later. That was what I was most nervous about. <laughs> had I forgot to record, Cat would have literally killed me. So this would have been the last Ethan and Cat on Yawa. All right. It would have just been Cat. It would have just been Cat. <laughs> Answering your questions with Cat. Uh, <laughs> so ask questions and then find a breeder that you feel comfortable with and that you trust and then go from there. Perfect. All right. We've got Roger Leith. Leith. Um, Yawa question. What does a regular day involve as far as time that you would spend training one of your young dogs in its first year? I heard and read short training sessions, five to 10 minutes, maybe twice a day, but that doesn't seem like a lot of training. Okay. So this is a really, really, really good question. And I think one that gets, um, uh, misconstrued in the exact same way that it sounds like that you're thinking here. Those five to 10 minute sessions are completely formal training structured. sessions, structured set up for that. Now, that doesn't mean that your dog's not learning anything the rest of the day. They're pretty much constantly learning from the time that you take them home to you. Well, basically from the time that they're born on, but specifically the time that you've taken them home and then they're going to be a year old, they're constantly learning, whether that's good things or bad things. So there is a lot of learning involved in that. And I would say with one of our puppies, let's say I've got a new puppy. The dog is eight to 10 weeks old, whatever. Um, we're going to let them out to pee first thing in the morning. Then that dog is going to pretty much instantly go back in their crate because I have other dogs to get let out. So get them out. Then we come back up to the puppy who has now had an opportunity to calm down because it's probably complaining that he had to go right back in his crate. We let him out again. Go potty. Let's uh, set him up for success. Because it's maybe been 20 or 30 minutes, give or take. Pees again, comes into the house. Then we do our morning meal, some training session involved with that. And then guess what? Potty break. Back in his crate. Then we go to work. Now, we work from home, so he's going to get a potty break somewhere in the vicinity of two to three to four hours, depending on exactly the puppy and our schedule. But lunchtime-ish on an average. He gets to go out, potty again, come into the house, hang out with us. We've got time. We're eating lunch. We're around watching him for the most part, her, whatever, um, playing with toys, interacting, out to go to the bathroom again. Back, back in, in the his crate. crate. Then we go back to work. Whatever we're doing, maybe we got to run to town, run errands, shoot ship some, some stuff videos. out. Shoot some videos. Whatever's going on. 
back in the crate for a little bit. Then he's going to come out dinner time, and usually after dinner time, they're out pretty much the rest of the evening. Um, whether that be going outside for an exercise run with some of the older dogs or by himself, but there's a structured training session with dinner meal, and then from there, uh, playtime, 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 um, which involves trying to develop good habits. That's what I was going to say. So. Like you were Not saying at just the beginning, do whatever you want, you're, you're but, always learning because we're always developing behaviors in those young dogs that we're going to want in our dogs as adults. So not ping ponging off the furniture and bouncing correct. off the walls. Anything they're doing, they're conditioning themselves to. So um, then we would go out to potty multiple times throughout that time period, especially with the eight week section as we come into 10, 12, 16, less potty breaks, but they're still there. And then back in the crate for bed. That would be a typical day for one of our puppies. There's a lot of crate time in there, but there's also a lot of valuable exercise and training time mixed into that. So that's a really good question. From AW Small 9 on Instagram, we just got our eight-week-old GSP two days ago, and he sleeps all the time. Is this common? Not for our puppies, typically. Uh, usually that first day, they're a little Is worn it out. a short hair? GSP. GSP, okay. Yep. Uh, Usually that first day, you see a little more mellow, maybe into that second day, where they're pretty worn out. It's a big adjustment, a big change from going to, from their litter mates to their new home, their new environment, depending on how long that trip was. It can be a little stressful on them. A lot of stress. Yeah. It can be very stressful on them, depending on you know the level of socialization with that puppy and things like that. So I would say, though, in... The next day or so, if your puppy really isn't pepping their step up a little bit and acting more like a puppy, uh, you might want to get them into the vet and get them checked out. Make sure that they didn't pick something up on the ride home or are just... Un- Let's not even wait the next day or so because whenever these questions came out... Oh, um, yeah. that I, check, And our video is not going to come out for a few days because it's sure, editing time. Check a temperature if you're getting to this. I mean... Check their temperature, get them into the vet, get them checked out. Something they could have picked up, and it's very, very common, would be some type of virus or bug. Some, one of the most common is parvo, but there are lots of different things out there. It could even be something as simple as something that's giving them diarrhea and just putting them under the weather that's not a virus yep. necessarily. But There's a lot of things going on. Usually sleepy puppies are not a good thing, so yep. that one's one we need to probably... Vet. Push to the vet if yes. they haven't pepped their step back up already. I was a little like hung up in a loop because there's another question here from Roger Leith and I was trying to figure out if it was a short question or a long question. So I think it's a shorter question. It says, just followed your three posts on Woe Training with Legend. Boom. Uh, got a lot out of it. Great videos. Thank you, sir. Prior to this, I had listened and watched to a video of trainer using Woe Post, dog half hitched at the belly, um, for those of you that don't know, it was to be a dog half hitched at the belly using the length of the rope tied to the post and then a second rope attached to their neck, basically. So then you have them attached via the waist, more or less to a post and attached to you via a check cord. Um, and then where the dog is basically pulled into a woe position in condition to this prior to the use of a belly collar, uh, then moving on to the neck collar, thoughts on this additional step or technique. Um, I actually use a woe post situation with dogs that struggle with a belly collar. Um, it doesn't happen all that often, but it is a valuable tool. Um, we are huge advocates for watching and learning everything and then finding what fits best for your dog. So knowing all of the things are good. A majority of dogs that are pretty normal, a majority of the dogs that we work with, I go straight to the belly collar work because I'm really comfortable with that and most dogs figure it out very quickly. I think that um, the Smith brothers or something, they start every dog with the, the post and the ropes and they stretch them all out and get them to stand first before they move into belly collar. It's not a bad idea, um, but... It's an unnecessary one most of the time with the dogs that we work with. Especially so. because we're introducing that stop and stand their behavior using our positive pigeon drills. So they already have a fairly good understanding of that stop and stand their whoa behavior. Mm-hmm. So it's not like we're just throwing a belly collar on them and they have no idea what we're trying to even expect of them. And the, the one other thing that I could say with that is if you put the collar around your dog's belly and they have a adverse reaction just to the collar there like some dogs will spin around or they got to figure out what it is it weirds them out enough 
I would say that that would be a dog that would be a candidate for maybe taking that half step back and use all, utilizing the other. That half hitch process um, kind of helps desensitize the dogs to that pressure around that specific area. So, good question. Next question. Really good question. Let's go with that. From Lily.cuz on Instagram. Tips for not jumping on the couch or biting hands during play or to initiate play. So if you don't want your puppy to be jumping on the furniture or the couch or anything like that. Place training. Place training. Place training. Place training. It depends on how old your puppy is. Place training. Um, By the time they're able to jump on the couch, typically they're to the age where they can work on place training. Yeah. Um, And then for the biting hands during play and to initiate play, we have a bite inhibition video. Uh, Biting and nipping at hands has definitely become a pretty common theme. So there'll probably be some more videos out in the future. There definitely Um, will. But it's hard sometimes because not all of our puppies are biters. Most of them are not, actually. Quest was the last puppy that really was nippy and bitey during play. And we did a video about it because I'm like, yeah, we should address this. And she's the only one that we've had before or since that we've really had that issue with. And um, doing that bite inhibition training with her has completely fixed that issue. In order to show you how to work with a biter, we need a biter. If somebody wants to volunteer their biter, bring them on. (laughs) That's right. All righty. Is that it? On that, on that yeah, so check out our bite inhibition video. See if that'll help you out. Perfect. All right, next question we got from Danica Noel Shan. Shan. Um, we've got an, from Facebook. A, from Facebook, we've got an adorable eleven-week-old GSP puppy, but she's got a little biting, chewing, mouthing practically all the time. Hey, we got another biting question. A biter. Uh, so also constantly jumps on us: legs, feet, toes, hands, clothes, and a jumper. And a jumper. In the kitchen and the dining room. I'm eight months pregnant. Congratulations. Um, But I also understand that uh, that could be You don't want to be jumped on as well as you got a new baby coming. Yes. Baby quite soon and want our puppy to be in a better position so she doesn't accidentally hurt the baby. Excellent. I'm going to say right off the bat, if you have an 11-week-old, so you're talking three months old, puppy's going to be four months old when the baby comes. Um, Not Hopefully. Hopefully, as long as everything kind of falls in line. Um, We definitely don't want the puppy to get neglected when the baby comes home because there would be the potential for that. We just did this. Babies take a lot as well um, as puppies take a lot. But uh, when we had our new baby, we kept a fair amount of separation. Um, Very controlled viewing time. The puppy got time. Um, babies at that age do sleep a fair amount, but the, depending on the baby, if you're lucky, but, um, if you're lucky, but keeping them separate, isn't going to be a bad idea. It's it's going to be a good idea for a while because those new babies are very fragile. Yes. And those young puppies are pretty rambunctious, full of energy. They're trying to hurt them. They're just clumsy and yep. And accidents happen. So. Um, I would say that, and this kind of goes with the last question, place training, place training, play, just play the clip again of me saying it it's 50 a loop. times. A loop, place but training. work on place training. Um, the more emphasis that you put on place training, we do this a ton with our dogs. Um, learn to stay here, learn to relax, learn to be part of things, and realize that you don't have to be a spastic freakazoid in order to do that. Because place training eliminates the potential for the naughty habits to happen. Mm -hmm. So then they become conditioned out of the option because they're not ever conditioned to do those things. They don't learn it's an option. And in your situation, you should already learn some of those things are an option, but you can condition them out just by not allowing them to do them. So that is where I would stay. Place training, place training, place training. Play it again. Um, Great question. And congratulations again. Yes. Babies are exciting. Puppies are exciting. From Lily.cuz, I think she asked two in a row. And I didn't even catch it. At home remedies for a clipped quick. Well, you can get things. Cornstarch. Yeah. Or you can get things from Amazon, like styptic powder or those silver nitrate sticks that are little chemical cauteries. Uh, Pressure. I mean, that's typically 
if it's not a terribly quick how nail. bad is it? Yeah, how bad is it? But if it's not terrible, putting a paper Hopefully towel... Hopefully it's still not bleeding by the time you <laughs> see this response. Right, that would be a very bad quick. Um, but typically, if you use like a paper towel and put pressure on the end of that nail and hold it there, that's going to allow it enough time to clot up. Um, and then you just gently remove that towel. Yep. But it definitely depends on how bad the quick is and um, how much bleeding is happening. But the cornstarch is also an option. Great question. Um, and then practice as much as you can trimming nails and... Less quicking. Less quicking. But that does happen. Um, yes, it does. Uh, Lee Fi, we will be picking up our GSP puppy in a few weeks and have been watching your Rogue and Quest puppy series on YouTube to help us prepare. Awesome. I have a question about clicker training. Your video explains very well how to charge the clicker and teach basic commands with the clicker during the training sessions, but I'm not sure what I am supposed to do in between training sessions. Let's say we have done a clicker session or two teaching sit, but are just hanging out in the house between sessions and the pup sits, or maybe I ask her to sit because she was jumping. Do I have to carry the clicker with me and treats all the time? If so, for how long? So, and then it says, same question, same question, there same question, same question. There was one other person, question. yeah. The, the, that one got Couple dittoed people. a lot. Yeah, yep. So, um... It by Donna Nielsen Sitta and Charlene Fabe. And okay. one other person that and I didn't get on the screenshot. Sorry. Ah, that to be unnamed. <laughs> um, it's a great question, and it's one that gets asked a lot. So we'll spend just a smidgen of time, but it's a pretty simple answer to it. The more that you have the opportunity to carry the clicker around and mark good behaviors, the more you're going to see those behaviors in everyday life. I say that one of the most common things that we see or hear from people is my dog does great during their structured training session. But as soon as the clicker and treats or the clicker and food or the whatever is gone, they pretty much don't listen at all. So the if you can, they make little uh, wrist scrunchy things that you can have your clicker too, and it can be wear, worn around your wrist. Or wear it on a lanyard. Or wear it on a lanyard. If you keep it on you when you're out in the house in that environment where the dog has the opportunity and do random um, sits and rewards and show the puppy that if they're listening on a regular basis, that they can get rewarded on a regular basis. As long as you have a food motivated dog that's excited about that, um, that's going to be a great idea. It now, allows you to generalize your training. So that the training and the expectation of that behavior doesn't happen just in a training session. We do that in the kennel actually all the time. So the dogs are expected to be obedient and behave during a obedience training session. Mm -hmm. But we also have that same expectation of obedience when we're healing to the field and we're doing recall in the field. We have that same level of expectation when we're going out to the let out pen. Some dogs will actually work on healing out to the let out pen, healing back from the let out pen recalling during let out. So generalizing that obedience behavior in multiple environments, multiple situations, not just during a specific training session, will just make your dog that much more conditioned to those behaviors and better at them. Absolutely. And then when does that go away? Typically once we've developed a strong understanding and have started collar conditioning, most of the clicker training stuff goes away until we're teaching something new. So that would be it on that one. Great, 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 great question. This was a clicker training question too from Megan underscore Kenny on Instagram. We have an eight-week-old pup coming. How soon do you recommend starting clicker training? Right away. Yes. Right away. Right away. Who gave that guy a microphone? But to be serious, yes, right away. You've got the volume. <laughs> He has to clap for himself, but he's got to remember to turn the volume up. Uh, but start by charging the clicker and then moving into clicker training. We've got videos, standingstonekennels.links that show all no, that. Standingstonekennels.com oh, yeah, slash yeah. links. <laughs> he always does all the, the links things, and I messed it up. Next question. Silas will put it on the bottom, so we'll all see it. Nick Hebner. Uh, what is this? What is this? Instagram? <laughs> yeah, there's a little heart. Is it better? I don't use the social medias. Um, is it better to complete <laughs> woe training or trained retrieve 
first? Uh, it's an awesome question, and I wouldn't really say that there would be a huge difference between the two. Kind of, kind of depends on the dog. Um, either is your dog suck at retrieving or suck at woeing? I mean, that would be where I would start first. And typically, if if I was thinking about the process, usually we're looking at formal woe training at a young, uh, typically a little bit younger age than the train retrieve process. Depends on how old your dog is. Uh, you're probably right. I would say the average dog. The woe average training, dog would probably woe would train first. Formal yep. work, so. As well as that woe training can be super beneficial for being in the field when you're having birds shot over them. And that's definitely going to be a necessary step when you're putting all the pieces of a trained retrieve together of getting back in the field, shooting birds over your dog. You need a dog to be steady so you can shoot birds over them. Good so. call, hon. Hey. Thanks for the question. Look at that. You changed my mind in part one a little bit and had a thing to add. I changed your mind in part two a little bit. If you didn't see that, you should check out part one. Um, this is a good one from Katie Rodningen on Instagram. My GSP is eight weeks and I got him at seven weeks and he will cry in the kennel for hours at night. Well, Whoa. first of all, it sounds like you have a very determined puppy. Which will be beneficial later in life if you hunt and work and do other things. Yeah. But not as much fun now. Yeah, and um, without knowing exactly what's been going on for the last week, because you got your puppy at seven weeks, it's now eight weeks old, you've been struggling with um, crying overnight in your kennel. Um, some of the things that can prolong that crying behavior is... Anytime a puppy cries or whines or struggles or fights something and then gets out of that situation, they just think, well, I will do it that much longer and struggle that much harder next time. And eventually I will get let out of that situation again, whether that's getting so out of. It's reinforcement based training. Yes. And reinforcement based training is extremely powerful, especially when it's the dog's Idea. Idea, yeah. Which is why free shaping is so powerful and so awesome because it's truly the dog's idea that you are reinforcing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really powerful way of training a dog. However, this can also be very powerful, but not usually in a good way because the dog says, hey, I cried and I whined and mom came to check on me, see if I was okay in my crate, which I wanted the attention. So let's try that again tonight. She's not coming. She's not coming. Okay, I'm just going to do this because eventually she's going to come and check on me. Whether you let them out of the crate, you just came to give them some attention. Um, even if it was negative attention where you came in and you're like, hush, quiet down. So still a puppy, attention. it's still attention. Yep. So there could be some things that you've already done, not knowing the whole situation, to reinforce those behaviors, to prolong them. Um, and if you have, or even if you haven't, and your puppy's just that determined to cry for hours on end. A few other tricks that you can do is, depends where your crate's at. Sometimes having the crate in the room with you helps. Yep. Sometimes having the crate not in the room with you helps. Yeah, so it depends on your puppy. It's like the opposite extremes, too. It's either in the back room where it's quiet and dark for sleeping and nobody is shuffling around or making any changes or anything like that, or... Um, it's right next to you in the bedroom and that makes it a lot easier. So the next, uh, thing would be making sure you've had potty breaks and a couple of things that way. But ultimately, um, we just need you to let, let us, us know, know a little bit more what's going on. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'll put a little treat in the puppy's crate for just at night so they can chew on it a little bit until they settle down. Uh, depending on when they're getting fed and watered last thing at night, they might actually need to go to the bathroom. Uh, also, I typically ask how much exercise is your puppy getting? They might need a little bit more so that they're not so wound up last thing at night. So Absolutely. lots of things that you can try, uh, white noise and towels over the front of their crate to make it more enclosed, lots and lots of options. So reach out, let us know what you've tried, what you haven't tried, and we can maybe give you some more direction. Next question is from Lacey... Lamen, la, lamen, sorry. Um, I've checked your site and your YouTube. Thank you for all of the videos. We have an 11 week old lab, two questions. She just recently started barking quite a bit, mostly for attention. She gets a lot of attention, but the barking has become a nuisance. We are ignoring it for now. Any advice? Um, first of all, kind of need a little more information about when the barking is. Is the barking happening in the crate? 
throwing her out in the backyard and she's barking. Um, there's a lot of things that go into that that Kat had just touched on with exercise levels and a couple other things. So definitely get back to us, throw it in the comments or check us out on patreon.com slash standing stone kennels, where if we're not getting to your question today, you get those questions answered on the daily. I'm pretty dang consistent of every day getting to questions on there unless something comes up. Um, Question number two, I tried to introduce her to a long lead for longer recall, but she just is playing and biting at the lead. Help. Okay, so that will go away with time. Um, the other side of it though, would be to have something enough to pull focus to you. And that would be some either light tugs or having a good reward at the end of the session and keeping our focus on you. Um, and then also a lot of times we'll incorporate another person with recall sessions so that they, she can really learn, um, not just a, you know, generalized habit of coming to you, but the ability to go to whoever is calling. So those would be the things I'd work at. I'd work on, definitely reach out to us. From Issa Boyley on Facebook, we have a 10-week-old GSP puppy female Reese. We are using your videos to train her, and it's working very well. Awesome. Awesome. The only thing is that she's not going to the door when she needs to potty. She only had a few accidents because we put her outside after playtime, crate time, eating, etc. How can we train her to ask for the door? So... That is a very good question. Um, Bell training has worked for a lot of dogs where you hang a bell on the door and you teach your puppy to ring the bell every time before they go out. And then when you take them out, they come up to the door, ring the bell. Uh, Something that I know that I've seen people do or they have told us that they do is they're playing with their puppy and they're like, oh, it's time for a potty break. And they scoop their puppy up and they take them and they walk outside and they set them in the grass. Well, your puppy goes, huh, that was cool. Now I'm outside. Now I'm outside. How did I get here? Yeah. And you need to show them and teach them where they need to go in your house, in your new environment. Um, And if you can pick one specific door that that's the place that we're going to go out and go potty, whether that's the backyard into a fenced area or the front yard, but pick your spot so that your puppy can learn that consistency of where they need to go to go out. Same door, same place. Every time in the beginning is the easiest. Uh, next question is from more X, X, I, I, I. So what are they? 23 more 23. Um, where can I find a trained retrieve table? Like the one y'all have, I had that custom built by an aluminum guy. So an aluminum welder guy. Uh, the top is uh, HDPE. It's a specific depth that was just set for inlaid on that. But, uh, find a local metal shop and they can make you one or you can make one out of wood. The uh, would be drastically cheaper. Yep. Next question from Donna Nielsen dash Sita from Facebook. Sorry about the name. Yeah, we're, trying, we're terrible folks. at names. Uh, love the sprig videos. My nine week old chocolate lab responding immediately. Now looking for the next step. She knows here, sit and down. Thank you guys. Thanks. You guys are great. I would follow along with Spriggs training series if that's uh, you've got a lab and you're at nine weeks old and you've been watching some of his videos. Go to standingstonekennels.com slash links. You can click the button Spriggs series and it will show you step by step all of the videos that we have, which is in the 20 some vicinity. Yeah. And it's in order of how we trained him, what steps we went through with him. And for all of you that are watching, you get to know that there is the potential, very, very, very good potential of another Sprig video singlet of his homecoming. He may get the opportunity to do a little bit of retrieving work with his dad, Brock, from Riverstone Kennels. So uh, stay tuned for that on our YouTube channel. If you're not already subscribed, click that subscribe button. It helps us out a lot. We appreciate you all. And you won't miss the notification if you hit the bell that uh, that new video came out. So. Next question we've got here is Eric Malfaro. Thanks for answering my last question. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. That wasn't a question, but you're very welcome. Uh, (laughs) Next is (laughs) Lee Kayak Fishing. What are some ways to encourage puppies, young dogs uh, to be more independent? We had that question. I think it was asked in a story. Yeah, we did have that question. So I didn't realize it was the same account, though. Is it the same account? I don't remember saying that account. 
Well, we answered that question in part one. Because it was almost exactly the it same as exactly somebody else's question, the same. I think. So, uh, Unless Lee, it was your question. Kayak fishing, definitely check out part one. <laughs> Next question here. We're going to try one more. Uh, Blue, Third time's the charm, right? Blue with a V, B-L-U-V, Jeep. It says, at guy with the pink gun. See if you can read this one correct, <laughs> LOL. Just kidding. We... <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure you were just kidding. I've been doing excellent at reading tonight. I'm an excellent reader. Um, we have a nine-week-old GSP that loves to bite when she is in a playful mood. Biters. We currently use the ouch technique. If the biting gets worse, we get up and walk out of the room. This issue with leaving the room is that she turns it into a game and bites our legs as and clothing as you're leaving, basically. Any suggestions on how to redirect her energy to stop the biting? So I want to make some clarification. We've talked about this a few times, but first of all, again, anybody that wants to volunteer up their biter, bring them out here. We'll shoot a video on how to work through the biting. We need some biters. Bring them on, people. Um, the biggest thing is the ouch technique. Um, it it kind of has to mean enough. It has to mean something. So what this is was brought around is when puppies play with each other, if one puppy bites another puppy, the puppy goes ouch and or screeches and or if the biting yips, continues whimpers. yips screams a bloody murder we have the litters here um in our house basically it's a part of the room and we can hear sometimes the puppies down there going like having this little fight fit where one is playing too rough with the other and it sounds like a puppy's dying i mean it's horrible and you run, you and run and check down on there to check on them yeah and it's like oh they were just wrestling and the one puppy is saying leave me the beep alone, okay? That hurts. That hurts. So um, the biggest thing is that we have to be able to relay the same kind of message to our dog. So they bite us and you say, ouch. Well, if that doesn't make it, then you up that to where it's louder and it needs to get to the point where it almost and the startles inf- them. Yeah, and the inflection gets across that that wasn't an exciting ouch. No, it that wasn't was fun. That was a painful, it wasn't that hurts me ouch. Almost to the point where sometimes we'll even get you know, more in their face even. So it tried to startle them with it, you know, and ouch, and they get right that. And if they get taken back, then you know, you did it right. If they don't and they continue to play, then, then it they isn't think it's quite just a enough. game. And if you've tried as loud as you can and everything else, then that method is not going to work for you. So we need to try something else. The next is we can do some form of correction and then, and or redirection. And a lot of times what we err to, would be redirection in that point. You know, it's going to be, okay, you want to bite and you want to chew on something. Here is a tug toy. Here's a chew bone, something. Let's play a game. Not biting me, bite this thing. And with repetition, you can get through that. So that would be a way to do, unless you want to bring your biter out here. Uh, Since I was able to read your question, you should see, you should hear me talk in person. Bring, bring the, bring the puppy out. I don't know where you're from, but we need a biter. We'll shoot a video. Next question from who? Uh, oh, Ryan Walner. That was an easy one. On, I just lost my place on Facebook. Rear, rear, rear. Wondering what your guys' thoughts were on running a younger GSP with a lab. I'm concerned about stepping backwards in steadiness, but would hate to leave the lab at home. If it's a young short hair, a young pointing breed, running them separately is your best bet. Because yes, otherwise that steadiness training is going to go backwards. They're going to want to flush when that um, flusher flushes, when your lab flushes, um, and it's going to create a lot of competition and it's going to be difficult to keep your um, pointing dog steady. Run them a season of steadiness birds on their own and then look at potentially hunting them together. So if you don't want to leave your lab at home, Rotate fields, that sort of thing with your dogs is a better bet, just so that you're setting your pointing dog up for success as well as your lab up for success, Um, especially because in that first season, if you put all the time in that you can and make sure you're developing the behaviors that you want out of that dog. You'd be glad you did. Yeah, yeah, it's going to prolong your enjoyment of hunting with them over the next, you know, 10, 12 years. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it says Wenning Ethan, and this is going to be the last question of the night. Close your phone down. We are over our time limit. And the only reason I read this one is because it said Ethan in the name. So lucky you. You winning already Ethan. read that one. No, I have not. Yeah. Just, just over there. 
It says, how many dogs do you guys have in your kennel a day? Do they get to walk by themselves or do you do them all together? It doesn't say Ethan. Oh. Wenning Ethan. The name. I the, thought na- the Instagram tag. I thought you handle. meant like it was to you. Like, no, Ethan, no, this no, is a no, question no, to no, you. No. His hmm. name is Ethan. Okay. All right. So um, how do we, how many dogs? We average around 20 dogs in the kennel. Uh, we have six employees plus cat and I, so there's plenty of help here to take care of them all. Um, they get exercise in small, not exercise, potty breaks in small groups, and then they get individual training sessions, uh, most of them seven days a week. Um, some dogs need a little less than that, and that's a question that gets asked a lot. How much do dogs get, everything else? A lot of that comes down to that dog's personality. So I like to think of every dog as having a specific amount of fuel in the tank, if you will, And that is how much training that they can do. When that tank is empty, all you're going to do is cause problems. So you have to, you know, you run your, if you run a diesel truck empty, that's a bad deal. So think of dogs as like diesel trucks. Don't run them empty. It's a bad deal. Um, I like your analogy. Yeah, uh, it's a bad deal. So um, run them down to where they can be in that 50% or a little less range so that it takes the edge off their even keel, whatever. Then they have time to charge those batteries back up and they're ready to train again. Um, For some dogs, that's three to five days a week. For For some dogs, it's seven and a half days a week. So it just depends on the dog and each dog is going to get exactly what they need while they're here. They do get small recess sessions like we like to refer to them, which is mild controlled chaos. They go out with a group, they get to play as long as everybody is getting along. It's really good socialization for them. And some dogs that come in lacking confidence, this is what really helps them a bond with another dog that we can incorporate into their training sessions if necessary, as well as just allows them to come into their own as a dog. Yep. So potty, play, go back inside, and then they have their individual training sessions on top of that. So that is a really, really, really good question. And that is it, folks. I'm out of I'm out of bourbon and we're out of time for the evening. We appreciate all of your questions and definitely look forward to doing this again next week we definitely tried to get through as many as we could i think we killed it we got through a ton we got through a lot it seemed like anyhow thanks guys for watching i'm the guy with the pink gun and i'm cat the dog trainer we will catch you next time we crushed that baby